The definition of cultivate is to prepare land for the raising of crops. It can also mean to grow and care for. Some examples of how I cultivate my friendships include sending cards, texts, emails, or making phone calls to stay connected, taking a walk together, taking a trip together, sharing a meal, sharing laughter, sharing homemade treats, or asking someone, how can I help? Perhaps you cultivate your friendships in some of these same ways. But what about those first seeds of friendship? Say it is the first time we've met. How do I know if a planted seed will actually grow? How much effort should I spend cultivating something that might not ever bloom? Truth is, there isn't a guarantee. Like a garden, you could spend a lot of time tilling the soil, planting, watering, and weeding. Statistically, you will most likely be blessed with a good crop. But there's also a chance that squash bugs could take over the zucchini, or the weather doesn't cooperate with the tomatoes. There is a chance all that hard work could still end in failure. I know I've experienced both success and failure in both gardening and relationships. It is a risk we take. But oh, how wonderful the gifts when we succeed. Seven years ago, when I began attending UUCCI, I didn't know if I'd connect with anyone. The first time I met Patty Wade in Fellowship Hall, I didn't know she would become one of my closest friends here. I'm very thankful for her friendship and for so many others who extended invitations to eat, learn, walk, and talk together. Each time I attend a UUCCI service, social event, or volunteer opportunity, it's been an experience of deepening my connection to each one of you. I appreciate getting to know everyone here. Over the years, we've shared personal joys and sorrows. We've worked together to accomplish goals. We've learned new things together. We've celebrated collective successes. We've cried and supported each other during crisis moments. Recently, our community has been given an opportunity to cultivate a new relationship with the Afghan refugees at Camp Atterbury. We don't know them. We don't know if they will become our friends, co-workers, neighbors, or even if they will stay in Indiana. I'm thinking this is a chance for us to use our tools of kindness, generosity, and compassion. What will our efforts reap? We don't know for sure, but I'd like to be optimistic about the friendship garden we can grow together. The Arabs used to, stay, used to say, when a stranger appears at your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is, where he's come from, where he's headed. That way, he'll have strength enough to answer, or by then, you'll be such good friends, you don't care. Let's go back to that. Rice, pine nuts, here, Take the red brocade pillow. My child will serve water to your horse. No, I was not busy when you came. I was not preparing to be busy. That's the armor everyone put on to pretend they had a purpose in the world. I refuse to be claimed. Your plate is waiting. We will snip fresh mint into your tea. Connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot always tell by looking at what is happening. More than half a tree is spread out in the soil under your feet. Penetrate quietly as the earthworm that blows no trumpet. Fight persistently as the creeper 
that brings down the tree. Spread like the squash plant that overruns the garden. Gnaw in the dark and use the sun to make sugar. Weave real connections, create real nodes, build real houses. Live a life you can endure. Live a life that is loving. Keep tangling and interweaving and taking more in. A thicket and bramble, wilderness to the outside world, but to us, it is all connected. Interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and layers. This is how we are going to live for a long time. Not always. For every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. Every gardener knows that after the digging, after the planting, after the long season of tending and growth, the harvest comes. The harvest comes. I love this reading, this poem, this lowercase truth, these words that are filled with meaning and beauty, with reminders and ultimately encouragement. I turn to these words when I need a reminder and when I need some encouragement. I turn to these words when I have lost a sense of hope or when I have grown weary. In a word, as the title suggests, this poem is a reminder about the importance of connections. More than that, this poem offers a blueprint and a pathway to the intricacies of cultivating connections in life. This month we are exploring the theme of cultivating relationships. Last week I hope you were able to see the documentary we showed on African American experiences in Columbus, recognizing that relationships, rootedness, a sense of place, a sense of welcome, does not come equally to all people in our community. The work of relationships are sometimes neglected at the social level. But today we are looking at relationships at the personal level, at our level, zooming in to what we can see and touch and cultivate. Words matter. And so right off the bat, I, I want to share that I am enamored by the imagery of cultivation. Besides, as I have shared before, that I came from a horticultural lineage, I also love the imagery of cultivating relationships because it embodies the challenges, the challenges, the time, the science, the art, the pain, and the nourishment that is present during the tending and uh, caring of our little patch of the garden. Relationships don't just grow on trees. They require a tilling of the earth, of your heart. They require the seeding of possibility, seeding the unknown, the risk. And they require careful tending, noticing, patience, and compassion. I think about how much we have talked about this uh, during the pandemic, about the challenges of cultivating relationships during a time of social isolation. And yet, oddly, for some of us, our relationships have deepened dramatically during this time. It's almost like as the pandemic separated us to our homes, it encouraged us to lean in more to the connections that do sustain us. The pandemic helped us to lean in to our relationships, literally lean in to our Zoom screens. How does this work? Lean in to the vulnerability, but the stronger necessity to not go it alone in this life. I think about how much has changed 
how much has changed since the first time I shared this reading with you as a congregation. Do you remember? It was May 7th, 2017. May 7th, 2017. Yes, that was the day you called me as your minister. Feels like yesterday, feels like an eternity, but however it feels to you, or even if you were not there, I know one thing is true. It feels, there is feeling when we return to the moments where relationships were seeded, to the moments when vulnerability grasped us and invited us to lean in, to the moments that we couldn't see the future, when we couldn't see the future, or the growth or the harvest, but we put our intentions before us and took the next step. The final words of my sermon on that Sunday in which you called me to be your settled minister were the following. And in the wide open spaces before us, may our heart opening connections sustain us and guide us through all the days to come. We knew there were wide open spaces before us, before this shared ministry began, before this pandemic or that Hindu temple, before politics or elections, before tragedy and loss, before all of it. We knew the wide open spaces called us to match that breath, that openness with our own hearts and our own and the connections the relationships that we were continuing to nurture in the days to come. I feel everything I have cultivated or tried to cultivate these past four and a half years have been towards this opening of hearts and deepening of relationships. And I hope you have felt your connections to one another and to me grow along that way. It takes time to cultivate relationships. It takes a lot of time. March Piercy uses the tree as a metaphor, helping us to see. Saying connections are made slowly. Sometimes they grow underground. You cannot always tell by looking at what is happening. More than half a tree is spread out in the soil under your feet. Even as we long for the flower to blossom, to rise up and open, the roots are indeed moving down and stretching wide. And they're taking hold for the seasons of life ahead. They are preparing. I think that image of relationships is appropriate in the botanical sense, but also in human reality. Each of our relationships don't grow at the same rate, and the growth doesn't sustain the same rate over time. That root structure imagery reminds me of another graph. Another graph we have uh, seen a lot of lately, the exponential curve. It stays low for some time, as if nothing is happening, nothing is noticeable, not yet. And then sometimes, like a light switch, some, sometimes like a dimmer, that arc the relationship, the light, the flower shoots up and reaches higher and higher toward the sky. But it is with patience in life and it is with patience in ministry that the key is found. Not patience alone, but patience and understanding that something may be moving, may be emerging just beneath the surface. I think about how odd it must feel to be a gardener in a world of increased consumption and alienation from our foods. I tried my best this year, I tried my best to garden. Literally garden, I had a, a little patch, I even weeded it, I even tilled it, tilled it. And I planted a few things, cherry tomatoes, salsa, peppers, and tomatillos. But I sure felt my lack of experience during that time of trying to reconnect to the intimate process 
of cultivation and creation of life. I felt comforted thinking of my late grandfather, knowing he didn't always know what he was doing back in the day either. Perhaps I will pick up a few things or two with a little practice in a few more years. But again, for those who are gardeners, like gardeners, those who commune with the natural world of planting and tending to the earth, a disharmony can be felt, I'd expect. At times, when we encounter people or activities that it feels contradictory to our affirmation of our interdependence, of our oneness with life. Never should we mind, says Marge Piercy. Never should we mind, says Marge Piercy, encouraging us onward when with the call to, quote, weave real connections, create real nodes, build real houses, live a life you can endure, make life that is loving, keep on tangling and interweaving and taking more in, a thicket and bramble, wilderness to the outside world, but to us, it is interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and layers. I love this imagery, a thicket and bramble, wilderness to the outside world, but to us, it is interconnected with rabbit runs and burrows and layers. We must not psych ourselves out as gardeners, as caregivers of this earth, of our fellow human beings, of life itself, even as the world at times feels cruel and selfish. In fact, in those times when the garden is most obscured, most denigrated, in times when it is most forgotten, it is in these times that we must find strength to persevere. It feels like we are in, and perhaps have been for some time, a moment of human history when our gardens are becoming neglected. I think about the work and struggle, pain and loss happening in our own state. Medical and educational first responders are tirelessly working to keep our garden burdened, our kindergartens verdant, our vibrant, vibrant and viable. Team Rubicon, the Red Cross, the State Department and volunteers from across the state, including some of you, have tirelessly, have tirelessly tried to add your support through donations, through volunteering with our Afghan guests to keep them safe and fed, to keep them closed and dignified and also visible. You see, we must make the garden visible. We must keep the, we must keep alive a vision of love and compassion and make that visible. We must keep centered the work of service and care, tending to what we can, offering connection and relationship that is life-giving, or as Marge Piercy writes, live a life you can endure, make life that is loving. Your generosity last week with financial and physical donations is astounding. And a dozen other organizations, faith communities and social sector groups like the library and the NAACP have also been generous and active in regards to our support of our Afghan neighbors. You have not asked who, but how. Not who are these people, but how can we help them? Not what, but how. Not what is their official legal status, but how can we help them? Not when or where, but how. Not how long will they be here or where will they go, but how can we help them? This matters. This really matters. And it follows in step with an era of practice of cultivation, an era of practice of relationships to the stranger. Naomi Shehab Nye writes, the Arabs used to say, when a stranger appears at, the, at your door, feed him for three days before asking who he is, where he's come from, where he's headed. That way he'll have strength enough to answer or 
by then you'll be such good friends, you do not care. We here are about connections, about relationships, about service to others, kindness and support of others, knowing we will be fed as well. We will receive the gifts of life as well and that there is no excuse but to answer the door or go to the garden. There is no excuse, no option, but to empower one another towards connection, empower one another with the knowledge, the tools and skills for cultivating relationships. Our collective nourishment, let me say this, our collective nourishment and liberation will not come by putting a cherry tomato or a salsa pepper or a tomatillo in every pot. That is not the long work before us. We must learn to cultivate each of us together here and beyond this place to become the people the world needs us to be, the congregation we are called to be, that called us together, that will continue to call us forward in shared ministry, one season after the next, one harvest after the next, one new planting after the next, after the next, and after the next. May it be so, and amen.